Welcome back everyone, I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this month I'm excited to present a video that I did for my Patreon members one year ago called ACA Manual T, Air Distribution Concepts and Terms. In this training we actually walk through terminal devices, primary secondary air, surface effect, air patterns, velocity, and flow rate. So. Without further ado, let me jump right into the training. A really great resource from ACA that is uh, very concept and uh, important in selecting terminal devices, hence manual T, right? So the purpose uh, and scope of this manual is really to give you the basics so when you design your duct system, that you're gonna be able to prevent drafts and sort of uh, stagnant air problems that you may have if you don't select the right terminal devices and then run the ductwork to that terminal device, right? So it's gonna walk you through how to select, size, and locate supply and air, uh, supply diffusers, grills, and registers, and also the return grills. Um, not to say you didn't use diffusers on the return, you could, most people don't, all right? So this manual is part of the residential design process. Um, it actually can apply to uh, the commercial side as well, uh, but there is way more expanded commercial concept air distribution information and manual Q. Manual T really focuses on the residential portion of it. Um, maybe some like commercial applications, all right? So like a small cafe or something along those lines with duct distribution. So in the process, this right here, manual T is gonna fall after you do your load calculation and before you do your duct sizing, manual D. So I used to actually select the equipment first, then work on the duct side, including terminals. But you'll notice there's not a direct line through that uh, with equipment selection, manual S. So I typically went J, S, T, D. Hence S, T, D, get it? Uh, one inside joke, right? Um, just kidding, all right. So. Uh, content of manual T, we're actually gonna focus on section two, um, but it does walk through, section one is very uh, broad, what makes people comfortable, um, really broad concepts. I'm gonna drill, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit deeper into air distribution concepts and terms in section two. The rest of the manual really dives into details on high sidewall terminals, ceiling diffusers, floor and sidewall outlets, um, what kind of pressure loss you get with these devices and the performance of supply and return. Um, obviously sound levels, how to select uh, inlets and outlets, and then of course balancing these and measuring airflow. So not manual B, which we talked about a few months ago, uh, balancing the whole duct system, just one register, right? So um, that accumulated in a process would be followed in manual B. So we're gonna get into air distribution concepts and terms today. Um, that's the section we're covering. Hopefully we can do it in less than a half an hour. All right, so some very basic stuff here. If you guys didn't know, a grill, there's there's really three, or depending on if you split up diffusers into floor and ceiling, there could be four here, but um, there's three types of terminal devices, all right? So the grill is really just louvered or perforated. There's no adjustment, all right? Typically for a supply grill, you'll find it on a wall or floor. Most people don't put supply grills in ceilings, um, even though that's what's pictured here on, on there. Um, on a return, you could typically see a return grill on a ceiling. Um, actually, there's plenty of uh, grills that are cut into um, supply plenums for let's say a restaurant or something along those lines. So they could be in many places, but just think about it. This is just a stamped louvered or perforated grill. There's no adjustment on them, okay? A register is basically a grill plus a damper. So that is the uh, the classic 421 from Hart and Cooley right there on it pictured. Um, grill plus a damper, it gives you the ability uh, for minor adjustments. And these could be located on the supply or yes, the return. Most people don't use grills on the return because they don't want people shutting them off. But if you wanna make minor adjustments to the balancing of return ducts, you could do that at the register. Keep in mind, the more you turn that down, the noisier it's gonna get because the velocity is gonna go up to pull the same volume of air through it. So most people put dampers in ducts in order to make adjust large adjustments. Minor adjustments can be done with the damper and a grill. And usually with uh, registers, you'll find them on walls, ceilings, or floors, right? All right, so let's get to diffusers. So a ceiling diffuser 
Um, you'll typically find in warm climates, um, not always the case, sometimes attic applications, uh, um, you'll see uh, plenty of ceiling diffusers. Um, but the ceiling discharge can either be horizontal or parallel to the ceiling. All right, so um, you could get non-directional, meaning it just throws it straight out, or the ceiling diffuser could be one, two, three, or four way. So let's say um, you wanted a, a three way diffuser that's in a ceiling in a corner. So that way you don't blow air into the corner, right? Um, they also, you'll find uh, parallel ceiling diffusers, uh, maybe a linear style diffuser. You'll find these in long rooms or hallways or even in restaurants, or I used to work on a ton of those with BAV boxes and uh, commercial applications, right? So that's the long register with just a slot on the inside that you can make a slight adjustment to airflow. Of course, um, you could get uh, discharge vertical as well. So straight, not parallel to the ceiling, but straight down. Um, if you have a really high ceiling, that might be a case for that, all right? Um, typically warm climate diffusers, uh, you'll see in ceilings or high wall because uh, typically it's just a heat pump or an air conditioner. Um, you'll see a lot of low floor uh, baseboard or low sidewall diffusers in cold climates uh, for obvious reasons, right? Because um, there's the old adage, heat air rises. Um, I'm not gonna play the semantics here and explain how it doesn't rise, but um, it's easier to throw warm air from the floor, right? And mix the air in the room correctly. So that's kind of what's considered a cold climate diffuser, but you could use them both. You just have to make sure you select the right diffuser to mix the air in the room. And we're gonna talk about some of those concepts here, okay? So uh, I'd say four different types, ceiling and floor diffuser, you can split into two. Um, if you just wanna use terms, grill, register, and diffuser, three different things, three different terminal devices. All right, so um, when you're selecting these uh, diffusers, um, you're gonna wanna take into account the throw and the spread, that's two different things, all right? Typically for a throw, if we're on the floor, we're gonna wanna throw heating air four to six feet, okay? And that's because, and I'll talk about the terms in a, in a minute, but it's gonna mix in the room, right? I won't use the other terms that I'm gonna introduce in a minute here. In cooling, we wanna throw the air six to eight feet typically because usually we have at least an eight or nine foot ceiling, all right? That's gonna help mix the air in the room and get the moisture back to the return to be removed at the coil. So if you don't throw the air that far, then you're not gonna mix the air in the room, you're not gonna get the moisture back, you're gonna keep turning the thermostat down, it'll be cold and clammy, and it could be a simple terminal selection. Now this is really important in cold climates when you have, let's say, a gas furnace in a basement. Someone comes along five, 10 years later and throws an A-coil on top of that gas furnace and adds air conditioning. And I'm telling you right now, those registers most likely were not selected to throw six to eight feet. They were probably selected to throw more like four to six feet. Now, the great part of this is, is you can easily replace registers. When you replace the register, don't just think about throw, think about spread as well. And when you select a register, feet per minute, along with the angle of that register really impacts throw and spread. Okay, and you can see there's another term on the bottom there, aspiration. When you actually have a high velocity air coming out of there, all right, so let's say 350 or 500 feet per minute, all right, when you have that velocity of air, it's actually gonna pull the air around it with it, Venturi effect, okay? Um, or in this in instance, you're gonna call it aspiration. So typically with heating, you want a wide spread, okay? Because you don't wanna throw it all the way to the ceiling. The, the narrower the spread, the further you can throw typically. Of course, you're gonna narrow that spread in cooling because you wanna be able to mix the air all the way up to that ceiling. Um, or the same thing from the ceiling down, right? Just be careful you don't throw that on people. All right, so uh, when we talk about throw, the closer those angles are on the register to throw straight out, you could have a zero degree spread and that might throw, let's say 25 feet when you look that register up. When you start to get a slightly different different angle, right? Let's say a 22 degree spread. It's gonna throw less distance, but it's gonna spread and cover more surface area. Or you could throw, let's say a 45 degree with the same register, all right? And only throw 12 feet, all right? So you can see from the angle here, as you change that angle, you're not gonna be able to throw it as far. So it's quite possible if those are adjustable, it's as simple as turning those veins back out in cooling in order to make sure you can mix the air in the room. 
All right, so a slight little diagnostic uh, tip here that's a little bit more advanced than, um, than concepts and terminology, all right? But I, I wanna try to apply this for you guys so, and gals so that way everybody knows. So when we locate a register in a room, there's a couple things we wanna talk about, all right? One, the primary air pattern. So if you can see, um, I threw a profile picture up here and I'm sorry for my crude drawing on uh, PowerPoint here, but you can see if I'm looking down on the room, what the primary air pattern and heating here is. This is what I selected and what I, what I planned on doing. I wanted to put a high wall register in the middle of the room so that way I can easily throw the correct distance and mix the air in the room. And typically, if you look at the profile here, you're gonna find that that heat starts to rise. And what ends up happening in it is it'll actually pull that uh, air pattern up when you move it along a register, right? I just have a couple notes here. Um, I wanna call it the right term. So that is typically um, the surface effect, right? So you're gonna have a low pressure right above, close to the register, right above that primary air pattern. And that surface effect is gonna pull that warm air up to the ceiling, okay? And really that's important to stop uh, the stagnant or the entrained air, I'm gonna show you in a second. Typically, if you put your hand in front of this primary air pattern, it's gonna be moving faster than 150 feet per minute. And there's gonna be a noticeable temperature difference between the air that's coming out of the register and what's in the room, okay? But when you move further and further away, the air pattern starts to expand and you start to feel less temperature difference and of course, less feet per minute, all right? So what we really wanna look at is the total air pattern. So you can see here, this is in cooling, that's why I made it blue. Um, I wanna be able to throw that full distance and when I have the total air pattern here, it's the envelope that encloses all the air because as that air is being thrown with a high velocity, remember you have that low pressure near the register, it's gonna, that surface effect is gonna pull the air right up to the ceiling and come around in this instance, okay? Um, and you know, there is gonna, uh, because the supply air has a big temperature difference, that cool air is gonna drop, right? And it's gonna start to engulf that room, okay? Um, when this happens, obviously the total air pattern, when you're not measuring right in the middle with the primary air, it's less than 150 feet per minute. It's probably gonna be a lot lower than that when you get further away, okay? What ends up happening here is if you can't throw all the way, um, and, and even in some aspect uh, on a normal system, all right, you'll start to get what's called entrained air. It's what's above, what I'll show you on the next slide, stagnant air, okay? So this entrained air, because that cool air is falling, you're starting to get this effect where the velocity of the primary air or the total air pattern is pulling that entrained air back up. It's the air moves very, very slow. You typically can't feel it, maybe 15 feet per minute, really, really, really slow. Um, but it starts to create these separate zones and gradient differences in the room, okay? So that's why it might be cooler when it's down here in the room and warmer when you're up above until you hit the total air pattern and you can feel the cold air up here, okay? So that's what creates that gradient difference in the room. Now, below that line where the entrained air is, typically you're gonna have a low velocity air that's moving, that's moving across the bottom of the room and between, you're gonna have stagnant air and you don't want a lot of stagnant air, okay? Um, the primary air pattern and the total air pattern should be throw far enough to where it's gonna be able to mix in the room and you'll have the least amount of stagnant and trained air you can, okay? If you can't throw very far, you can see how then you're gonna have more entrained air, more stagnant air, and you're not gonna be able to mix the air in the room and it'll be very uncomfortable, all right? So sometimes that means increasing velocity, maybe changing the, uh, the register, maybe changing the throw um, or the location of the register, depending on the application. Just because it worked well in heating does not necessarily mean it's gonna work perfect in cooling. You have to address that when you go to do that air conditioning application, let's say. Or if you replace a gas furnace with a heat pump, because now you're gonna run an air conditioning, right? So really, really important you look at the whole system, not just the ductwork, all the way to the register, okay? So when you talk about registers, typically you look at gross area. Gross area is not what we're gonna to use to calculate the velocity or the volume of the air though. 
This is just how we select the register. So you can see the gross area here on this register is 12 by eight and they were targeting 300 CFM for that instance, okay? So um, 12 by eight is what you would use to select the register. Obviously there's that flange all the way around to create that sandwich in a ceiling or a floor, all right? So you'd screw that right into the duct boot and it would pull it tight. A lot of people are using airtight. Um, uh, other brands are all one piece now that go into ceilings diffusers. Those are really nice as well. Um, nothing against those. Obviously, you have a different gross area for those. You have to look that up with the manufacturer, okay? Um, gross area, you have to take out, and usually people use the AK factor, but you have to take out or look up the actual free area, all right? The free area is when you minus out all the veins and the louvers, okay? This is really, really important in, in order to not create noise and to measure the volume of air and help you in balancing the system, okay? So you have to look up the free area in order to use that in the calculations. So typically, if we wanna see how much volume of air is coming out at a register, we would use an anemometer, all right? Anemometers look like this on the screen. This is a full vein anemometer. Those are easy at registers. I personally have used hot wire or mini vein anemometers. I've measured full volume of air and ductwork, and I've also been able to use that at the register. Obviously, you can't stick this particular tool into the duct system and measure volume of air. So I like to have a tool that does more than one thing, all right? Um, or you could use, let's say, a pitot tube and measure velocity pressure with a manometer, okay? So a couple different methods that you can use here. Um, I like the anemometer, it's much uh, cleaner, but it really depends on how you're holding it. So the bigger the vein, the more likely you're getting a good measurement. So that's why something like this is decent for registers. I just personally like to use one tool, multiple applications. So. A little bit of math here uh, early in the morning. Uh, hopefully, uh, and I wanna thank everybody that's joining me live, but you can rewatch this. There is gonna be a recording here. So if you are gonna measure velocity at a register, you would get an average across that register. So if you have a minivan, you're gonna actually take multiple measurements, evenly spaced all the way across the register, add them all up, divide by the number of measurements you took to get an average. If you have a good tool like this, you can actually start a recording and take an average across that register. Really, really, really slow. All right, then you would look up that register. This happens to be a 421 floor register and it's four by 10, okay? So four by 10 is not free area, that's gross area. So you have to go to, in this case, it would happen to be a Hart and Cooley register. Went, actually I went to their online catalog and looked up the free area for the 421 four by 10 register. Free area in square inches is 27 square inches. So that's where we start. We measured feet per minute and we have now square inches. We have to turn square inches into square feet to get area. So in the equation, Q is CFM, area is in square feet, and velocity is in feet per minute. So there's just one more conversion we need to do. We need to turn 27 square inches into square feet. So we divide 27 by 144, that's one square foot, 12 by 12, and we end up with 0.188. So three decimal points is the furthest you need to go. Anything past that isn't gonna impact the CFM calculation. Okay, so in this instance here, I measured 550 feet per minute. I multiply that by 0.188 square feet, and we end up with 103 CFM. Actually, that's not too bad for that register, okay? Um, probably a little noisy at 550 feet per minute. Um, I'm willing to bet that fan's on high. Um, obviously, we would balance that off of what is needed in the room when we did a room by room load calculation and the duct design, okay? So on the back end, it's really important to have all this paperwork in line. We selected the right register based on what we wanted for throw and spread, but we know we need to hit this volume of air. Once it's installed, do we actually get that volume of air? That's how we can make sure the rest of it is in line. Because I can't measure throw and spread. It's really, really hard, all right? This is the one measurement you can make to make sure that everything hits design. So what did you guys think? Did you like the training on ACA Manual T? We went through all air distribution concepts and terms that came from the manual. If you like this training, make sure you subscribe to the channel for obvious reasons to make sure you always get my most recent videos. But if you want all of these videos one year in advance, you can get that just as a HVAC Pro Blog Insider on my Patreon page. We have tons of content over there and you can join for as little as $8 a month. I look forward to seeing you soon. I'm Chris with HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis.